All right. So I want you to take yourself and I want you to put yourself back to the early 2000s. I know some of you were babies then, but for those who were not, I want you to put yourself back to the 2000s. Uh, and someone has taken you to a crusade or a revival, an evangelist, and something has kind of tugged at your heart and your soul and your anxiety as the speaker insists that what is old and what is tired, what weighs you down can be lifted if only you'll find your way to the front. Your heart races, your stomach turns, you feel compelled and you walk forward. And in that moment, you encounter a feeling and a moment that leaves you feeling changed. There is something about the moment, but more so something about the person of Jesus that draws you in. And as the minister quotes 2 Corinthians, you are assured that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And then you return home to the same home. You go home to the same problems, the exact same challenges, the same things that upset you before, upset you today, the same annoyances at work, and your immediate react reactions are exactly the same as before. You get just as angry, just as annoyed, you snap at your kids, and you find yourself leaning into your favorite coping mechanisms to get through the day. And you wonder if it is true. Could it be that you are indeed a new creation? Because for all intents and purposes, it seems you are somewhat unchanged and unmoved, your same old self with your same old habits is actually the same thing. And you begin to wonder if this newness is actually for you. Or if in your case and in your situation, being in Christ is just about how deeply distanced you are from what it looks like to be recreated and reformed and renewed. It's not hard to go from engaging with Christ to engaging with guilt as we chase the promise that we will be made new. And so as the Israelites prepare to leave Egypt, they do so with freedom in mind. They're expecting that what is to come will be something new, uh, something better. And so the story, it begins with rejoicing as the people gather their livestock and gather their belongings and their small children and they have food for the journey and they walk away from everything that is familiar, from everything that they have known and from the place that they have called home for over 400 years. They leave behind Egypt, they leave behind their oppressor, they leave behind the ones that they feared, they leave behind a way of being and seeing that has kept them from independence, that has kept them from flourishing and from worship, from being who they were created to be. They leave a whole lot behind and they get ready to walk towards something new. And as they leave Egypt, they are free. And I want you to just imagine the scene that sounds of the animals, mothers saying shh, the rumbling of excitement and fear, the exclamation of disbelief and wonder as they say, could it be that God has actually come through, that God has heard our prayer, that everything Moses promised will be what is, that what they had hoped for, what they had waited for, what they had imagined was now what they were experiencing. How many of us have found ourselves in a similar space at the very place we hoped to be? The very position that we longed for, experienced exactly what we prayed for, what we believed God for, what we sat in humble expectation for. How many of us have found ourselves one step from freedom? It's so close that you can hear it, that you can taste it, and you feel it coming all around you. And so you take yet another step, and then another, and another, and everything you imagined could not be is exactly now where you are. But the irony of those moments is this, when we get the job, when we receive the certification, when we muster up the courage, when we gain the admission into spaces that we worked hard to achieve, the irony of those moments is that so often, it feels less like a victory and more like a burden. 
We're suddenly unsure and uncertain. We wonder about our qualifications, how we are perceived, and what it is that we might do with what has been put in our hands. And in those moments, we are reminded that there is a great difference between being free and living as though you were free. It's one thing to be free and another to live as though freedom is ours, as though liberation is what we are created for. The once enslaved people, those who are now free and expectant of something new, find themselves camped along the shore. It has been exhausting and it has been difficult. It has been overwhelming and tiring. From the day that Moses arrived and promised them freedom, they have encountered every hurdle and every barrier. And each step along the way, it seemed that Pharaoh would win, that the oppressor would conquer, that freedom was never going to be their own. But in each moment, God would do something new. Moses would say something different. And now they find themselves exactly where they prayed they would be, camped along the shore as free people. And just when they start to get comfortable, just when they're about to settle into their new reality, they see and they hear and they feel their enemy racing towards them. In the distance, the dust is rising, the hooves are beating, the chariots are moving, and the sounds of an army approaching is looming. And immediately everything they have seen and heard and experienced that spoke to something new, that promised something different, that revealed freedom seems wiped from their memory as fear overtakes them and anger overwhelms them. But there is one thing that I forgot to mention. In this account, the people have been following a large cloud that is shaped like a pillar. They have an angel that is going before them. And they have Moses who is speaking to them. They literally have everything that you and I insist we need to be certain that God is present. Yet with all of their assurance and all of their confirmation, despite the visible sign that God is with them, when they look behind them at the Egyptians running towards them, and they look ahead at this large body of water ahead of them, they turn to Moses and they are outraged. You have taken us from our comfort. You have taken us from what is familiar. You have taken us from where we were. You have taken us from where it was hard. But at least we were alive. At least we weren't in threat of being killed. The sea is in front of us and the army is behind us. And we are in the wilderness absolutely powerless. It would have been better for us to stay in bondage. That's not going to be the last time that they say these words. And I suspect they are words that perhaps we have found ourselves mimicking in our own day and our own time. That which is new sounded great until we realized that even as ones who are free, even as ones who are walking where we wanted to be and where we hoped we would find ourselves, trouble still exists. Hardship still remains. That space between hard and harder has not disappeared. And moments where we find ourselves in the midst of a literal rock and a hard place have not disappeared. And despite the spirit within us, the work of Christ around us, and the love of God within us, we can't help <coughs> but begrudge our new place of freedom and those who walked with us in that direction. Because we associated freedom and we associated being in a new space and walking in a new direction with the absence of trouble rather than recognizing that the greatest gift in that season is the absence of that which had us bound. The absence of that which had oppressed us. The absence of the space that left us unable to grow and to flourish and to become who we were created to be. But to find our way from where we are to where we are going is never without moments that leave us feeling stranded between bad and worse, immersed in fear, surrounded by barriers, and asked to trust and have faith when it is nothing more than the impossible that stands in our way. 
And we wonder in those moments if freedom is all that we thought it would be. We wonder if we were truly made new. And we question if we were actually created for more. Kate Bowler is a professor at Duke University, and she has done a lot of writing and research on grief, um, specifically following her own um, extensive battle with cancer in the midst of many Christian platitudes. And because she's a public figure, lots of people wrote to her during her illness. She also does writing for um, the New York Times. And some who suggested that her cancer was God at work, there were others who saw it as a punishment, and others who said, don't dwell on the sadness, instead think about the joy of heaven. All of these things left her feeling unseen, her ordeal belittled, and the state of her family dismissed. And she notes that in the midst of so many discouraging emails and letters and supposed attempts at encouragement, there was one type of engagement that left her with a little bit of hope and a capacity to experience sadness while still finding some light. She says, it's the letters that really speak to me don't talk about why we die, they talk about who was there. That when you were afraid that the end had come, when you, when you talk about when you were afraid that the end had come, were you alone? She tells the story of a man who wrote to her about this terrifying, life-changing experience that he and his family had encountered. And she notes this about this experience. She says, he doesn't rationalize why some are rescued and others are not. And he doubts there's a way that God might redeem the situation he was in by extracting good from it. But he does know that God was there with him when he felt peace. He knows that God was there with him when he found himself in a situation where he had no way out and his life was in danger and the life of his family was in danger. He says that he encountered indescribable peace and it changed him forever. He ends his letter to her with these words, I don't know how this works, but I wish the same for you as you move forward. What the people in the story of Israel seem to miss is who was there. And that is probably the greatest challenge for those of us who believe what is new that, and where there is freedom and spaces of liberation are exactly where we long to be. Our greatest challenge is that fear and disappointment and overwhelm that the army on one side and the sea on the other side will consume us. And in that moment, it often makes us forget who is there. In the Exodus account, the one who reminds the people about who is present is Moses. Now, Moses is a little bit annoyed and frustrated and most likely a little bit scared as well. But somehow he remembers in that moment who is there and invites the people not to ignore what is around them and that which is coming quickly towards them and that which is impossible to cross ahead of them. Instead, he simply says, but God is here. You cannot change what is happening you cannot fight the army that is approaching, and you cannot swim across the sea to the other side. But God is here. The moment is too big and too challenging and too overwhelming, but God is here. The reality is impossible, and the fear is real, but God is here here. And in that moment, Moses speaks and he holds up his staff and the cloud that was leading them now becomes a shield between them and that which wants to destroy them. And a wind blows, or a more accurate reflection is the Spirit of God blows over the water and a way is made for them to walk on dry ground to the other side. We might like to imagine that this is the end of the story. That's kind of where people cheer and clap. If you have ever watched one of the Ten Commandment movies, that's like the pinnacle highlight moment. And you kind of feel like the movie should end right then. 
That now that finally the Israelites can look back at the God who was there and now they can live in the power and the delight of all that is new and all that is ahead of them and all that they sense they have been called into. Now they are a new creation. But when the Israelites get to the other side, the army may have been gone, but the wilderness was still all around them. The unknown and the uncertain was still their present reality, and all that they had relied on for 400 years was behind them. But even if for just a moment, just a brief second, just a tiny window of time, they find a little bit of rest and they encounter a tiny bit of hope and they experience a little bit of light and gain a little bit of strength as they remember that their freedom is directly connected to who was there. But that isn't quite what we expect. Somehow it seems that crossing over on dry ground should mean that freedom is now their mindset. That they are recreated, that recreated is their position, and that they now acknowledge that they were made for liberation. What we hope for from this passage is that they now live as though they have just walked between two walls of water. That they now believe as ones who have experienced the phenomena of dry ground where it should not be. That they are now ones who operate as though they have been made new. But that is not the story. That is not what we will discover as you go through the pages of Exodus. Instead, we find that our own desire to be made new is so similar to the Israelites. It's a complex work in progress. So often in Christian circles, we insist that everything is about getting to the end. We love those easy, succinct answers. We want quick solutions. We want the joy of certainty, clear pictures, and victorious declarations. We long for the words in 2 Corinthians to be our instant victory. In Christ, we are a new creation. But what if the beauty of this passage is not found in the destination, but is rather found along the way? What if the actual celebration is found not in the single step in the right direction, it is not found only in leaving behind that which once held us captive, but is rather found in all of the various ways that we get to the other side? All of the ways that we find freedom, all of the ways that those things that once held us uh, in bondage are no longer comfortable for us. All of the ways that we discover unexpected dry ground beneath our feet. All of the ways that we are reminded about who was there along the way. All of the ways that we find ourselves made into a new creation because of the journey and not simply as a result of the outcome. And so for all of us who sit here having been told for so much of our lives or for far too long that this idea of being made new in Christ is simply a single finite moment, I hope that today you find yourself liberated enough to say, I am a work in progress. I am a new creation I am being made into a new creation, and I will be made into a new creation. I am free, and I am being made free, and I will be made free. I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. I am created for liberation, I am being made ready for liberation, and I will be liberated. And when you find yourself outraged because freedom isn't as easy as you imagined, when you find yourself burdened because being made new is not just one single step, when you become afraid because you find yourself in spaces and places that you were certain you would never encounter again between the army and the sea, remember that to be free, to be made new, to be saved, to be liberated is an all-of-life, 
up and down, filled with trouble, shaped by miracle, formed in the spaces where we are powerless, defined by the moments we recall who was there with us, shaped by the courage to stand firm and the faith to stand still when you want to give in and give up, day by day, a moment by moment kind of journey. And it is in the journey, and because of who is with us through the journey, that we find ourselves made new, that we find ourselves made free, that we find ourselves so confident that we are created for liberation. As we take steps away from that which has held us captive, as we find ourselves in spaces that declare the word freedom, as we find ourselves leaning into the invitation that even we can find ourselves recreated, may the fear of the army and the impossibility of the sea and our disappointment and our outrage in the moment not be that which keeps us from recognizing who is here with us. And the ways that that presence insists that we are free. The way that God insists that we are saved, that we are a new creation, and that we were always created for liberation. 